Triangles isolate pixels, and pixels are coloured in using perspective correct interpolation. This image represents computer graphics 101, and yet, the amount of auxiliary actions lurking beneath it is astounding. I initially planned to demonstrate a complete Vulkan application, but explaining swap chains in particular pushed this script off the deep end. Therefore, you get to assume the pedestrian actions of managing a swap chain, command queues, synchronization, and generally initializing everything is already dealt with. Our task, then, consists of building a graphics pipeline, thereby jumping straight to the beating heart of the operation. Here lie the GPU programs, the shaders. They originally did lighting calculations, and the name never changed. They are the programmable stages of the graphics pipeline. These pipelines came into existence with very limited fixed functionality, that have slowly become more programmable over the years, and the modern pipeline carries the weight of this history, with plenty of obscure options and deprecated strategies. Nowadays, the mesh pipeline has won. Well, sadly, not quite, but it is technically superior, and certainly the future. Anyway, the basic strategy has never changed. You fence off some pixels using triangles, and then color in the region. Since GPUs don't do conditionals or branching like CPUs do, they run up to 64 threads on the same instruction in lockstep, executing both sides of the branch, after which each thread individually selects a result. So triangle rasterization is the main tool for performant conditional execution. Let's begin with the pixel shader. Particularly since it's possible to ignore everything I just said, and dodge the triangle step, running a pixel shader on every pixel. Such a setup is an absolute classic. It's very simple, and fine for 2D setups as long as you don't do anything too perverse. All you have to do is provide a function from normalized screen coordinates to color. And this is great for making procedural textures and uniform 2D constructions. But you see, in 3D, the strategy is not going to scale. We're likely to be wasting a lot of work compared to coloring in a more precise, perspective-correct triangulation. Consider this plotter for 3D implicit functions I whipped up to demonstrate something flexible and compact. I've got a few random example functions here that we can plot, like this field. I can also swap from volumetric view to ISO surface, so it isn't see-through. I'll show you this blob and this rounded cube too. All of this looks nice until you peek inside and learn that every single pixel runs a 3D root finder, tracing a view ray and sampling 64 points along the path. Isosurface is even more complicated and calls the implicit function multiple times. Now, supposing the implicit function admits an analytic solution for the view ray intersection problem, then this could be extremely performant. Although, even then, since the geometry is implicit, Dealing with collisions, shadows, and generally integrating this into an engine would take more work. Perhaps if granted a decent programming language that isn't blind to algebraic structure and capable of doing calculus automatically, this sort of component could be awesome to behold. In the meantime, I'll allow you a glimpse into the future. Here's what a profile for our one triangle goal looks like. As expected, it's very far from maxing out the GPU. Most of the time is spent on synchronization. If we navigate to the vertex shader, we can see three threads total were dispatched. One per vertex. This was compiled in wave 32 mode, so 29 threads in that wave were idle. The GPU is not in the habit of launching single threads. The hardware has generally made aggressive assumptions to maximize parallelism. Next, the built-in rasterizer isolated the appropriate pixels, where you see the pipeline options I gave it. And now our hard-working pixel shader. It was launched in 1960 64 thread waves for a target 121 odd thousand threads total. The viewport was smaller than my full 4K screen and it only colored pixels inside the triangle so it was spared shading my screen's full 8 million pixels. And we can even take a brief look at the disassembly. This is what my hardware actually executed. Alright, let's take a closer look at PS Main. 
it receives from the system a position. SV stands for system value. It also may receive custom data from previous stages. Color is my random name. Could be anything, as long as the labels match with the previous stage. The position consists of four floats in screen space, all normalized in the range 0 to 1, and that is relative to the viewport. But wait, four floats. The first two are understandable. The Z, maybe you guessed, is the depth. You can use that for occluding or blending colors, or really whatever you can think of. As for the fourth, it's the weight, or the scaling factor. You can recover the familiar 3D Euclidean coordinates by dividing x, y, and z by the weight. You see, this isn't a 4D Euclidean system, but 3D homogeneous. That is entirely standard in computer graphics and projective geometry. Not only can we now represent points at infinity, but a single 4x4 matrix and homogeneous coordinates can encode any combination of translation, rotation, scaling, and perspective projection. A 3x3 Euclidean matrix can't do translation or perspective projection. Those are non-linear, and matrices include only linear transformations, as is maybe clear if I pull up the definition here. The genius of the homogeneous system is that we perform the non-linear division by W at the end. Until then, projection and translation are linear, and so can be encoded by a 4x4 matrix. Some formulas, especially involving projection, become simpler and more symmetric. Besides, the GPU has four float-wide SIMD registers, so it would be a shame to leave that fourth slot hanging. By the time we reach the pixel shader, the division by depth already happened, so the W coordinate has served its purpose. It's kept around, mostly because it may as well be. I suppose it could serve to reconstruct view space position. Anyway, our triangle model is static and 2D, so we can leave the Z and W coordinates alone. The colorized output, SV target, is most of the time four floats, RGBA, normalized between 0 and 1. You can set up your pipeline to render to multiple images in different formats, and a classic is making depth or stencil images in a pre-processing step, and then using them to accelerate further rendering. The color value was passed in by the previous shader stage. It is called an interpolant. You see, the reason we get a rainbow triangle, despite this pixel shader doing nothing, is the rasterizer's interpolation. That happens by default to all values passed in. Interpolation does a perspective correct weighted average. The formula uses barycentric coordinates. That means relative to the triangle center and is on screen. If W, the homogeneous weights, are all 1, as is the case in our setup, it simplifies to a weighted average. Otherwise, it introduces compression along our line of sight. With that clarified, we now understand enough to graduate to triangles. Is our free vertices and a vertex shader using the old strategy, which you can promptly forget about because we'll be using a mesh shader. They are better in almost every way, except backwards compatibility. There used to be a time when few cared about supporting even one-year-old hardware. Progress was emphasized, and mesh shaders were introduced in 2018 and picked up by AMD some two years later. That is almost six years ago now, so at this point they are 100% fair game in my opinion. Although it would be nice if our engine could fall back to the old pipeline, for those people that want to run our app on low settings on ancient hardware. So where is the mesh shader's advantage? The first point is you get precise control over triangles. So your vertex shader basically insists on triangle strips, but now we can optimize vertex reuse. The key point is vertices on the perimeter of a thread group are shared between adjacent groups, and therefore duplicated. That also duplicates work, so it's highly undesirable. Previously, mesh optimizer libraries would have to approximate an optimal order to match the GPU's triangle strip. AMD's blog here reports an over 10% reduction in duplications by exploiting this extra control. Furthermore, a mesh shader lets you dynamically cull vertices. In a vertex shader, the draw call must decide CPU side how many vertices to output. That is unconditional, whether instancing or not. The mesh shader calls set mesh output counts in the shader and can thus decide to reduce the work dynamically. But perhaps most importantly, 
you unlock access to an amplification shader. This allows us to increase the work dynamically. The amplification shader decides how many mesh shader groups to launch with an optional payload. This enables all sorts of immense optimizations like dynamic culling and level of detail selections, all without round tripping to the CPU. And finally, because we explicitly export triangles, we gain per primitive attributes. That unlocks more techniques for dynamically creating shapes within triangles, especially in combination with barycentric coordinates. On older pipelines, attributes are per vertex, so some hackery would be required. Here's sourcing again from AMD's fantastic blog post. I like how this diagram demonstrates mesh shaders have obsoleted a rather large stack of hacks for doing tessellation and so on. All right, back to work. Here's our triangle mesh shader, starting with our constant triangle data, three vertices, three colors. Each vertex must be given a position system value, and since our pixel shader wants one, a color. Obviously, all interpolated values must match between these stages, or you would have a validation error, or a bug. These output positions are in clip space, that is, normalized between minus 1 and 1. That lets us know where the edges are without caring about the size of the viewport. If you need the viewport dimensions, you'll have to pass it in yourself. Similarly, z of 0 is the near plane, and 1 is the far plane, which would be relevant if we were doing a perspective projection. Now, we start by reserving space in the shader export. This is usually capped at 256, and from the point of view of the rasterizer, represents the worst case. We then call set mesh output counts at some point, or immediately. Notice we're allowed to dynamically export less than we reserved. When generating large meshlets, we'd rather export as many as possible to deduplicate vertices on the border. But we must not exceed the vendor limit, which apparently can be between 256 and 1024. These outputs are all indexed by thread ID. This is important to distribute the work optimally. We saw earlier that this will run three threads out of a 32 wide wave. It wouldn't be a good look to stack all the work on a single thread while the 31 others watched. AMD's blog post here does a great job at explaining all the performance considerations in further detail. But generally, you will have more triangles than vertices, and computing vertex transformation will be the expensive step. So you should set vertex count to be a multiple of the thread group size, and the triangle count to not be the limiting factor. They suggest 128 vertices and 256 triangles. If you have spare threads, they may as well be used to export more triangles. Now it remains to compile these shaders and feed them into a pipeline. And here is our reward. A pristine rainbow triangle. And more importantly, a deep understanding of the internal mechanisms that rendered it. As for the CPU side Vulcan stuff that was vaguely alluded to, it was swept under the proverbial rug. <laughs>